As any self-respecting Star Trek fan knows, Gene Roddenberry pitched the original series to the network as Wagon Train to the Stars. That's canon, part of the series legend. But what does it really mean? And is it true? For those who don't know, Wagon Train was a long-running and highly popular western of the golden age of television in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Also the heyday of the western itself as a format for serial television. The show ran for eight seasons from 1957 to 1965, its popularity peaking at number one during its 1961 to 62 season. Its premise was simple, chronicle the adventures of the diverse group of immigrants and travelers who picked up stakes on the frontier of the civilized United States, which sometimes included cities like Pittsburgh and Chicago, and went west into wild and sometimes uncharted territory to start a new life. Their vehicle of choice, the iconic Conestoga wagon, pulled by horses and oxen in long trains thus the title. When it came to westerns, Gene knew what he was talking about. Before Trek, he'd put no less than 25 notches on his belt, writing scripts for TV westerns, including one for The Virginian. But the other 24 were for what is often regarded as the best adult western of its time, the thinking man's western, Have Gun Will Travel. In fact, Gene won the Writers Guild of America Award for Best Teleplay of 1958 for his episode of that series, Helen of Abaginian. He claimed to have been head writer for Have Gun Will Travel. While there really was no such position, he did tie for writing the most episodes and worked on all six seasons of the show. So the pundits who argue that Gene didn't really mean it with his wagon train reference, that he was just using a convenient device that would simplify a complex concept and link it in executives' mind with something popular and successful, no doubt have a point, but they're probably missing one as well. Let's take a look at these two shows, the one he mentioned and the one he wrote for, and see if the foundations of Star Trek are there. The truth is, if you run a tricorder scan of Wagon Train, you don't have to be Mr. Spock to see some similarities. The two that stand out are that final frontier idea made famous in William Shatner's classic opening narration, and the setup of both shows. Space, the final frontier. In Wagon Train, the frontier was wherever the civilized United States stopped. For Trek, it was the boundaries of the United Federation of Planets and the last starbase where Enterprise refueled with dilithium crystals. In both cases, the idea was that the wagons or the starship were entering largely uncharted and dangerous territory, and the setup of visiting various outposts along the way and providing safe passage for dignitaries, refugees, and exotic characters gave both series their episodic structure, with the virtues of an anthology series in continually offering fresh faces and situations, but with the presence of popular continuing characters that the audience could identify with as well. One might also wonder if Gene didn't pick up the notion of the Captain's Log narratives from Wagon Train, in which Wagon Master Seth Adams, played by Ward Bond, or one of the story's characters, would often open the episode by describing the situation and players for that week. We always plan to be in California long before the first snow falls. And the rivalry between Bond and fellow actor Robert Horton, who played the wagon train scout Flint McCullough, which made the on-screen quarrels of their characters more believable, now you get off of that horse and give us a hand or I'll get somebody that will, may have given Gene some inspiration for the arguments between Spock and Dr. McCoy. I find your arguments strewn with gaping defects in logic. Westerns in general clearly influence the early development of Star Trek, though this fades some as the series moves on. The rough-and-tumble frontier setting of some of the planets and places the Enterprise visits in its first season, including the use of western backlots, abandoned ghost towns, the elements of costume design, such as the early landing party belts and boots, and the dangers that pop up like Apaches from behind any papier-mâché boulder to dispatch some unfortunate red-shirt security guard, all harken back to the show's antecedents in the American West. Spock was even compared to the Indian half-breed Mingo, played by Ed Ames on Daniel Boone, and McCoy's gruff bedside manner is reminiscent of Milbert Stone's Doc Adams on Gunsmoke, as Gene himself noted. There is no use trying to get through to an idiot unless you can talk idiot language. But while Wagon Train and other westerns no doubt helped Gene shape both Star Trek itself and the way in which he pitched it to network execs, the show that really left its tool marks on Trek is the one that Gene worked on, Have Gun Will Travel. But it's not hard to see why he chose not to reference that one when trying to sell his idea. Everything about Have Gun Will Travel was quirky. It was considered 
intelligent, often the kiss of death to a good sales pitch in network TV. Its main character, Paladin, not his real name, which was never disclosed, it was taken from the Knights Errant of the Middle Ages, was almost an anti-hero, dressing all in black and working for a profit motive, although he always ended up doing the right thing. Some of the stories Gene wrote for Have Gun Will Travel were notable for Paladin's reluctance to use his gun and to preach peace while struggling to reconcile the parties involved. I told you to take that gun off and forget it. A theme that Trek would visit repeatedly, as when Kirk tries to broker peace in A Taste of Armageddon, Day of the Dove, or Let This Be Your Last Battlefield. This is your death. We win. Nobody wins. Have any more of your men died? or when he holsters his phaser rather than shoot the silicon-based life form that eats rock and cooling plants along with assorted miners in Devil in the Dark. Have Gun Will Travel's visual style has been described as romantic in the sense of exotic landscapes, inviting scenes, and exciting heroics. Strange new worlds, 23rd century captain's shirts that somehow rip easily, and punch-ups with stuntmen in rubber lizard suits, anyone? It's also worth noting that the two series' lead characters, Paladin and Kirk, are both good in a fight, handy with the ladies, able to quote Shakespeare, That which we call a rose by any other name, it smelleth sweet, and sympathetic to alien cultures. Ambassador Spock took some offense when Captain Picard referred to the work that he and Kirk did in an earlier era as cowboy diplomacy. Cowboy diplomacy. But they did beat the Earps and the Clantons, after all, Inspector of the Gun, even if they were just alien projections pulled from Kirk's mind. To quote critic Brandon Nowak, Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek franchise is the child who looks most like its father, with its intrepid problem-solving explorers, sizing up local disputes, and spreading their own vision of justice and compassion across the frontier. Roddenberry famously pitched the original Star Trek as Wagon Train to the Stars, but it's not. It's Have Phasers Will Travel. Paladin didn't ride off into the sunset. He rode off into the stars. <laughs> <laughs>